now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. An episode of the ABC program Pat Novak for Hire, the first starring vehicle nationwide for Jack Webb, as it was broadcast 73 years ago today, April 16, 1949. Go away, Dixie Gilliam. And we thank you for joining us on this Saturday, 16th day of April, 106th day of the year, 259 days remaining until we get to 2023. A bill ending slavery in the District of Columbia became law on this date in 1862. Today it still remains a holiday in the District of Columbia. Bat Masterson fought his last gun battle in Dodge City on this date in 1881. Harriet Quimby became the first woman to fly an airplane across the English Channel in 1912. In 1926, Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner distributed as the first book of the month club selection premiering on the blue network of nbc on this date in 1935 jim and marion jordan as fibber mcgee and molly the show ran as a weekly show until like 1953 and then continued as quarter hour shows until 1956 with segments on nbc's monitor from 1957 till 1959 an explosion on board a freighter in port uh, charge caused the city of Texas City, Texas, to catch fire on this date in 1947, killing almost 600 people. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. penned his famous letter from Birmingham jail while incarcerated in Birmingham, Alabama on this date in 1963, protesting against segregation. Apollo 16 launched toward the moon from Cape Canaveral on this date in 1972. Apollo 16, uh, 62 nautical miles in altitude, uh, 135 nautical miles downrange. Apollo 16, now 33 feet shorter and 9,000 pounds lighter, unencumbered now for its mission in space. 16, Houston, four minutes. Everything looks great down here. Everything looks good up here, too. Hey, Gordy, you ought to see that horizon. Just gorgeous. Commander John Young and Lunar Module Pilot Charles Duke spent 71 hours, just under three days, on the lunar surface, during which they conducted three extravehicular activities, or moonwalks, totaling over 20 hours. Uh, let's see, it was on this date in 2004, the tender love story that is Kill Bill, Volume 2, was released. Was my reaction really that surprising? But I never thought you would. Or could do that to me. I'm really sorry, kiddo, but you thought wrong. Uma Thurman, David Carradine, starring in the movie and are featured in that clip. The deadliest mass shooting in modern American history occurred on this date in 2007 at Virginia Tech University. Well, today the university was struck uh, with a tragedy that we consider of monumental proportions. There were two shootings which occurred on campus. In each case, there are fatalities. A Virginia Tech senior shot 32 people to death, injured 23 others in two separate attacks before he committed suicide. Guns were prohibited on the Virginia Tech campus. The Supreme Court ruled on this date in 2008. Execution by lethal injection did not violate the Eighth Amendment ban against cruel and unusual punishment. And the New York Times and the New Yorker won the Pulitzer Prize on this date in 2008 for breaking news of the Harvey Weinstein sexual abuse scandal. Passing away on this date, the founder of the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, Marie Tussaud, from Vegas, Robert Urich, the TV show Vegas, I should say, football player, sportscaster, Pat Summerall, and Night Court's Harry Anderson. This is the birth date of Wilbur Wright, one of the inventors of the aeroplane. Uh, Charlie Chaplin, Born on this date, as was actor Barry Nelson, actor Peter Ustinov, composer Henry Mancini, Rudy Pompili, the saxophonist for Bill Haley and his Comets, actress Edie Adams, actor, uh, also, well, singer-songwriter Ed Townsend, Herbie Mann, the jazz flautist, singer Dusty Springfield, singer Selena, uh, musician Jerry Rafferty, Baker Street, and from F Troop, uh, Melody Patterson, 
This is the 95th birthday of the retired Pope Benedict the 16th, singer Bobby Vinton. Uh, she wore blue velvet. Also, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, 75 today. Bobby Vinton is 87 today. He was Stimpy from Ren and Stimpy. Roger Klotz on Doug and Philip J. Fry on Futurama. Billy West, 70 years old today. Ellen Barkin, 68. Jimmy Osmond of the Osmonds is 59. From Pretty in Pink and Two and a Half Men, John Cryer is 57. Martin Lawrence is 57. Excuse me. Vicky Guerrero, the pro wrestling manager, now in All Elite Wrestling, 54. Japanese singer Bonnie Pink is 49. And from American Odyssey and Stranger Things, Sadie Sink is 20. Those some of the people who celebrate the 16th day of April is their birthday, if this is your birthday. Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you. From 73 years ago, April 16th, 1949, Jack Webb, Pat Novak for hire on this Saturday, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds, but check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Pat Novak for Hire started as a West Coast-only program from 1946 to 1947. The show then uh, was done by somebody else, but uh, by Ben Morris played the role when... Uh, Webb and uh, writer who wrote all the Pat uh, Novak shows, Richard L. Breen, moved to L.A. to work on a very similar show, Johnny Madero, Pier 23 for the Mutual Network. We only have a few of those shows. That also was nationwide. Uh, then Webb was brought back to ABC in 1949 to do the nationwide version of Pat Novak for Hire. Of course, another little thing brought an end to the show on June 18th, 1949, it was a little thing called Dragnet for NBC. Let's hear now. Uh, Pat Novak for Hire, April 16th, 1949, Go Away, Dixie Gillian. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings transcribed to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for Hire. I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak, for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you always bite off more than you can chew. It's tough on your windpipe, but you don't go hungry. And down here, a lot of people figure it's better to be a fat guy in a graveyard than a thin guy in a stew. That way, you can be sure of a tight fit. 
Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that makes a sound like money. It works out all right. If your mother doesn't mind you coming home for Easter in a box. I found that out Wednesday night about nine o'clock. I closed the shop early and I came home to read. It wasn't a bad book if you ever wanted to start a forest fire. It was one of those historical things. And the girl in it wandered around like a meat grinder in ribbons. And it was moving along all right. She was just getting her second wind before going after the world's record when the door to my apartment opened and the place began to get kind of crowded. From where I sat, the crowd looked good. She sauntered in, moving slowly from side to side like 118 pounds of warm smoke. Her voice was all right, too. It reminded you of a furnace full of marshmallows. Good evening. Yeah, thanks for knocking. I don't think you mind my coming in without warning. No, I get the cabbage smell from next door the same way. Does it pay to be that polite, Mr. Novak? Saves you the trouble saying please. What's on your mind? That bottle in front of you. Will you pour me a drink? No, I won't. You'll save dough if you look up a bartender. All right. I came to use you instead of your whiskey anyway. Let's hear. My name is Lee Inderwood. I'll give you $300 to do something for me. It'll only take an hour. That's too much dough unless it's murder, and if it is murder, it's not enough dough. Are you afraid? I just don't like paid murder. I told you, when you get caught, the pain gets expensive. If it were murder, I'd do it myself. Mr. Novak, I want you to frighten someone for me. Why don't you hire a friend? Are they too pretty? It's a man named Dixie Gillian. You'll find him in an office down on Folsom Street at this address. I promise nothing will happen to you. That's what they told Benedict Arnold. He'll be in this office until 11 tonight. I want you to go in and see him. Tell him you're from Adrian, and that he's to get out of town by tomorrow noon. Suppose he wants to put it off. He won't. Don't let him know who hired you. Just tell him Adrian said to leave. Look, lady, you better go on home. For 300 bucks, I won't buy a tissue paper plot. Now tell me more or say goodbye. There's not much more I can tell you, except there won't be any trouble. He's a rotten little beast, and I want him frightened badly. Why? He's been bothering my sister. Why doesn't he bother you? Because I bother back too fast. Do you want the 300, Mr. Novak? It's going to be a long summer. Put it on the table. Good. And you'll need this, too. No, you keep that. I don't want a gun. It's empty. Don't worry. See? No shells. It's perfectly safe. Now, look, sis, I got a nasty disposition. You can rent that for 300 bucks, but if you want more, find a gunsel. I don't want you to be a gunsel. That's why I want you to use this gun. I know it's empty. Use it on Dixon. He'll scare fast. It's just a way to save some breath. All right. It's your 300. You'd better go now. Yeah. Wait till I get a coat, will you? If your doorbell rings, don't play mouse. Oh? Because I may look you up. Am I too young to ask why? Because if anything goes wrong, I'll be around looking for you. And from there on, it won't be nice. I'll dirty you up like a locker room towel. Relax, Patsy. You'll never learn to fall in love that way. She handed me the gun and walked out of my apartment. Seeing her leave made you feel like Frank Buck losing an argument. She walked with a nice, easy swing of a satisfied leopard. And for a small leopard, she had pretty good spots, too. Well, I put the gun in my overcoat pocket and I went down to Folsom Street. The address was down near the bridge entrance and the street was deserted except for a couple of winos near the corner trying to buy back 1926 at a dollar a jug. I stopped in front of the place. It was a machinery company and I could see a light burning in the back. I began to walk through the place. It was so quiet you could hear a worm with whooping cough and there were enough shadows around to keep a ghost happy for years. When I got to the office back in the corner, through the glass, I could see a man sitting at the desk. When I opened the door and walked in, he didn't seem surprised. Come on in, mister. You're bad on noise. Yeah? That's right. You make too much for a thief and not enough for a customer. What do you want? About ten words, if you're Dixie Gillian. Go ahead. You better look up a timetable. What makes you that tough? This. Oh. Well, you look tougher with a gun. Does it make you talk faster? Now, look, I'm going to say it's slow, mister. Pack up your ruppers and get out. Is that you talking or somebody else? I'm just the guy with the gun. Adrian does the talking. And he says get out. That's right. You got the whole message now. All right, you told me, so wander out and spend your dough. I will. Oh, you'll need part of it, though. Because I'm going to give you an answer for Adrian. I'm going to take that gun away from you, mister. You can pick the pieces out of your head on the way home. You better stand back or I'll share it with you. You've got your offer, mister. Let's see you make good. I'll oh, save your muscle, fella. Stop that gun. Save your muscle, fella. The gun's empty. Somebody 
foolish, mister. Sometimes you can get a home run with a half swing. That's the way it was this time. He couldn't have made it with a prayer book in both hands. He slid down to the floor and trembled for a minute and then flattened out like a leaf in a pool of water. Just before he died, he grabbed his side as if he didn't like the way it hurt. And then he didn't care. I rolled him on his back and let him look at the ceiling. His eyes were open and he looked surprised like a guy who didn't figure on a change in the weather. There was a scar that ran across his forehead and dug deep into his hairline. And he was lying there with a bunch of pink gum showing as if he was trying to pick up a few bucks with a toothpaste ad. Well, I didn't have time to tell him how sorry I was because if homicide caught me here, I'd have about as much chance as a canary in a basement full of cats. I started for the door, but right then I knew I could start ordering birdseed. It was Hellman, and he walked over to look at the body. Hello, Novak. The guy looks embarrassed. Yeah, I guess he is, Hellman. What's he doing dead? Putting in a beef somewhere, I guess. He rates it. He'll like you for that, Novak. How'd it happen? A team play. We worked it out together. But you've got the gun. That's right. I got the gun. Yeah. You feel like a bet? No, just keep stealing the old way. You know how I feel, Novak? You feel flabby to anybody else, but to yourself, I suppose you feel good. Look, I walked in here with a gun. There was some quick fight talk, and I killed him, but it's still not a good rap. I can get a long price on it for you, Novak. I'll bet you can, Hellman. You can give me a bad deal, but part of the time it'll be from the other side of the deck. Worse than that, Novak. It'll be all the time. And I want to watch you, because I think you're going to be a crybaby. I'm going to scream, if that's what you mean, Hellman. I'm going to scream about a gal that sent me in here with an empty gun. That's a big hole for a cap pistol, Novak. I got a last-minute curve. It was empty once. Yeah, that's the only way they make a gun. I don't want you for an hour ago. I want you for this dead guy on the floor. All right, all right. I told you I didn't come in here to kill the guy. I don't know him. He may even be a good guy. I'm sorry he's dead. All right, Novak. Just wait a few weeks. And you can tell him personally. Hellman had me up against the rail and he knew it. When we left there, he was wearing a big, toothy smile. It was big enough to sew on his ears. He called the coroner and told him to pick up the stiff, and then we rode downtown. He dropped the gun into ballistics and hauled me into his office. The reporters were there. He gave them the whole story and told them how to spell Hellman. After that, we wound up at the desk, and he booked me on suspicion of murder. The next hour and a half was the kind of stuff they don't write about in the paper. They call it interrogation, and when you're finished, you've been through a lot of tight spots, like an atom up at Caltech. About 11 o'clock, Hellman brought me into his office, and from there on, it happened kind of fast. I just talked to the DA. He's going to streamline things for you. Well, he's going to look funny going to trial on a guy you can't identify. We'll find out all about the dead guy. Well, you can't count his fingers without making a mistake. If you want to know who he is, talk to that girl. Her name's Lee Inderwood. We've been through all that, Novak. Now, suppose you tell me who Dixie Gillian is. I don't know, Hellman. The girl said his name was Dixie Gillian. I won't press you. I don't have to, Novak. I've got the only parlay I need. You, the dead guy, and a big fat murder gun. Oh, sure. Yeah, Hellman talking. Yeah, I know it was a thirty-eight. They're crazy down in ballistics. I saw them standing over the dead guy. They must have made a mistake, that's all. No, no, I don't want him in here. I don't want him in here. Hey, Tony. Tony, I... Ah. You're getting pale. You need some more rouge, Hellman. I got some bad news, Inspector. Well, keep it or you'll take more home to your wife. I'll talk to you later. No, talk to him now, Hellman. If that bullet doesn't match the gun, talk to him now. That's right, Inspector. A thirty-eight bullet, but it won't match the gun you brought in. It's got to match. I came in and found him standing there. He's already admitted it. It's a neat trick, then. If he fired the bullet out of that gun, he retooled it in midair. I'm not that fast, Hellman. Come on, get out of that chair so you'll have room to squirm. You keep still, Novak. I won't bother you. I'm going home. Huh? I'm walking out of your jail, Hellman. You got a broken down thirty eight that won't fit anything but your thumbs. You can't hold me on that. I found you over the body. I can hold you on suspicion of murder. Yeah, but it'll hurt tomorrow morning, Hellman. The papers will be down for a follow-up, and you'll have to tell them what it looks like out in left field. I'll handle them. You can't afford to let them start laughing at you. People get the idea it's your face. You can save car fare if you stay right here, because I'll have you back by noon tomorrow. You're not that good, Hellman. You couldn't hold a moth with a searchlight. The town ought to thank you. What? Oh, it's a nice jail, Hellman. With you around, it'll last for years. When I walked out of headquarters, I had a nice mess to juggle. It was like trying to walk the baby on a floor full of marbles. If things didn't add up for Hellman, they weren't going to do any better for me. I knew that gun I had went off. If it did, what happened to the bullet and where did the other one come from? And why weren't there two shots? Well, I couldn't put my finger on a thing and nothing added up. 
It was like trying to follow a grain of rice in a Shanghai suburb. So I looked up Lee Inderwood's address and I went by her apartment. A girl downstairs told me that she worked at a nightclub out on the Bay Shore Highway. Well, I had to hit a couple of places, so I looked up the only honest guy I know. An ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good man until he began to figure the last drink in the bottle is just as easy to get at as the first. I found him in a little leather-trimmed sink on Powell Street. It was a grimy little hole where they wash the glasses once a week in stale beer. But Jocko was more at home than a vulture in Calcutta. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to celebrate my return to health. Something mild for Mr. Novak, a double stinger, perhaps. No, forget it, Jocko, i got to talk to you. Patsy, I've just passed through a crisis. A few minutes ago, they set before me a glass with a woman's lipstick all around the rim. All right, Jocko. I took one gulp and looked at the glass, and in this dim light, I thought I was bleeding to death. It took them ten minutes and three mirrors to calm me down. Jocko, I'm in trouble. You've got to help me. But they washed the glass for me in ammonia. They must have left a little ammonia in the glass because the next drink had a very odd tang about it. I've had three more just like it, a, a sort of ammonia collins. All right, all right. So far, they've been using domestic ammonia. When the imported stuff comes in, I may give up whiskey altogether. Calm down, will you, Jocko? i got a bum shake tonight. Yes? I either killed a guy or thought I did. That uses up the alternatives. Uh, what are you doing now, taking a vote? I got hired to scare a guy down on Folsom Street. Ten minutes later, the guy was dead. Patsy, you take your work too seriously. Couldn't you have just scared him into a lingering illness instead of killing him? One of the props was an empty gun. Only when the fight came, it grew bullets. Hellman walked in right after on a telephone tip. What are you doing out of the gas chamber? The whole thing backfired down at headquarters. April 16th, 1949, Pat Novak for Hire. We'll have more following this break on your favorite station. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. It's a big, bold story set in the heartland of America, along the edge of Lonely Mountain. I am open for business. And so Big William Gorgon, played by handsome Michael James, fiercely set down his Midwest roots. Oh, darling, we're going to sell bathrobes and raise chickens. Set as adoring wife, Wilhelmina, portrayed by beautiful Glenda Olson. Oh, I love our store, Will. But they hadn't counted on Big Ralph's bathrobes and cattle store coming to town. Oh, Will, Will, what will we do, Will? Will had a plan, a way of facing off against tough Big Ralph. We're going to change the face of America. We're going to advertise. And for what? The print and broadcasting and bus benches are going to tell people who we are and where we are. What's a bus? And so the story of how one man brought advertising to the heartland. Oh, Will, will it work? It will. Well, my name ain't Will, Wilhelmina. you got to advertise or we'll die. And so the greatest marketing story of all time is here. Advertise or die, dopey. Put your message on this national advertising platform. Email classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station, an episode of Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb, as it was broadcast at 9.30 Eastern Time, Saturday night, April 16, 1949. In the newspapers of that Saturday, some 73 years ago, these were some of the headlines. 
President Truman is planning to battle for his nation a national health program. Labor leader William Green said after a White House visit yesterday, Green predicted that Truman will lay the compulsory insurance plan before Congress next week and may also take to the radio to tell the people about it. Green, the president of the American Federation of Labor, was one of a group which called on the president to submit a report declaring that organized medicine has choked the development of comprehensive health insurance plans. The report presented by the Committee on the Nation's Health, headed by Dr. Channing Frothingham, past president of the Massachusetts State Medical Society. James B. Carey, the secretary treasurer of the CIO, and Harvey Brown, president of the International Association of Machinists, they uh, gave the report directly to the White House. Senator Bridges, the New Hampshire Republican, yesterday demanded a congressional investigation of the State Department to find out exactly this country's policy toward China. In a bluntly worded statement, he accuses Secretary of State Dean Acheson of what he might be called sabotage of the valiant attempt of the Chinese nationalists to keep at least a part of China free. This referred to Acheson's opposition to a proposal by Senator McCarran, the Democrat from Nevada, for the U.S. to give China a $1.5 billion loan for military and economic purposes. In a letter made public Thursday, Acheson said such a move would involve this country in an undertaking of so great an attitude and a magnitude that it would almost surely be catastrophic. In this letter to Chairman Connolly, the Democrat of Texas of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Acheson said that China had been given over $2 billion in U.S. aid since VJ Day, but this has not stemmed the communist forces. Western diplomats made a new study of Russia's relations with her Balkan satellites in the light of the announcement that Bulgarian President Georgi Dimitriov is visiting the Soviet Union. The communists say he is there for medical treatment. This could be true since he is known to be in poor health. There was speculation, however, as to whether he had given up control over Bulgaria. Some observers guess that the Kremlin rulers of the communist world may have called him on the carpet because of his development of nationalist tendencies in Bulgaria. The U.S. Embassy in Prague demanded that Czechoslovakian authorities release Ms. Vlasta Vraz, an American relief worker who has now spent a week in jail. The embassy also wanted to know what charges, if any, Czechoslovak police have placed against her. Mrs. Braz of Berwyn, Illinois, head of the Prague Office of American Relief for Czechoslovakia. Under the auspices of that organization, she has distributed about $4 million worth of food, medicine, and clothing in Czechoslovakia since 1945. Too ill to work at his job at a Detroit creamery, 65-year-old Arthur Root was told by his supervisor to go out and sit in the sunshine. Outside, Root spotted smoke, dashed up to the roof of the plant with a fire extinguisher, calling for others to follow. The blaze quickly extinguished, and as the last thin column of smoke curled upwards, Root dropped dead with a heart attack. Those some of the day's top news stories as reported in the newspapers of Saturday, April 16, 1949, on your radio, Pat Novak for Hire, which continues now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The bullet and the phony gun wouldn't match. Oh, it doesn't add up, Jocko. That call to Hellman's a tip-off. I was framed, but why wasn't I framed all the way? Who is the dead man? Oh, just a guy with a falling blood count. His name was supposed to be Dixie Gillian, but there's no identification and no record on him. You shouldn't have hired out as a gunsel. I told you I didn't hire out as a gunsel. It was somebody else's idea. Oh, you have no conscience, Patsy. It's just a sort of soap opera rule of thumb you put into practice now and then, but no real conscience. You'd let a dying woman lie in the middle of the highway unless her head was resting on a pile of savings bonds. All right, Jocko, I'll cry with you later. I need help now. What sort of help? I want you to break into a girl's apartment. Yes? Don't worry, she won't be home. Ah, is that supposed to be an incentive? It's at this address here, up on O'Farrell. Her name is Lee Inderwood. She's the one who hired me. If the girl's not there, what am I supposed to find? Anything that'll connect her with a dead man. 
He's a big guy with a scar. That doesn't help much. You can't miss. Go through the desk and drawers. Pick up everything you can, will you? And leave a message at my place. As soon as I finish this drink. Oh, hurry up, will you, Jocko? Leave the glass alone and get going. Don't rush me. Hurry up, will you? The glass is empty anyway. Yes, that's what you thought about that gun, but the fellow got an awful jolt out of it. Good night, lover. I went by a horse parlor on O'Farrell Street and borrowed a car from a guy. It was after midnight when I started down the Bayshore Highway, and about a half hour later, I pulled up in front of the Cat's Paw. It was a long, rambling place on the left side of the road. There was no plan. It just followed the erosion line until they ran out of material. There was enough neon in front to light a main intersection in heaven. In the lobby, I saw a picture of Lee Underwood, one of those shadowy things that was supposed to make you think she'd die in a cold climate. She was sitting at a piano with a little microphone in front of her, and you got the idea right away. She didn't have much of a voice, but plenty of songs that made your wife lean over and ask you to explain. I asked a 50-year-old busboy, and he said she was back in her dressing room getting ready for the 1 o'clock show. When I walked in, she was sitting in front of a mirror working on an upswept hairdo. If she swept it up anymore, it was going to leave her head. I stood behind her, looking at the pink, fresh part of her neck that didn't show when the hair was done. You seem fascinated, Patsy. No, I just want to know where to break it. Oh. Sit down on the footstool next to me. Yeah. That's it. I like to look down on people. Hmm. Let me brush that strand of hair back. Or do you like it in your eyes? Now brush it back so I can see your answers. Who's Dixie Gillian? What difference does it make? None to him and some to me. He's dead. No, he couldn't be dead. Yeah, well, he'd like to believe that, too. I couldn't sell him that story about an empty gun. He couldn't have been killed with that gun. No? No, I put in a blank, Patsy. Somebody used a hard-working bullet because Dixie's dead. There was no reason to kill him. I don't understand. Yeah, well, that makes you even with homicide, but they got a bigger team. Now, look, I made a diagram, Angel. Up at my place, I ran over murder with you. I don't like it. If you kill people, you don't get invited out enough. So if it's you or me on this one, I'm going to push you all away. Don't understand it, Patsy. Who's Dixie Gillian? He was after some microfilm. I thought I could scare him away. You better be ready to identify him because homicide stopped. Even that scar didn't help. What scar, Patsy? The scar across his face. There's no record on him. No, no, Patsy. Everything goes wrong. Everything you touch goes wrong. That's the wrong man, Patsy. Yeah. Well, it's too late for a recount. You've got to get to that body, Patsy. I don't know how, but some way you've got to get to him. You look good, Lee. You make a nice picture. Wait a minute, Dixie. You don't need your coat. Come on. I don't know how it happened, Dixie. I didn't mean it that way. If you like it that way, all right. Bring your boyfriend, too. No, don't let him, Patsy. The gun's too big. I'm going with him. I would, too. April 16th, 1949. Pat Novak for hire on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Sunday's Classic Radio Theater, an episode of Jack Benny from 67 years ago, April 17, 1955, as Jack and Bob Hope double date with Mabel and Gertrude. And you know that's going to be weird. That'll be coming up on Sunday's Classic Radio Theater, but let's wrap up this Saturday edition. Jack Webb, Pat Novak for hire, April 16, 1949, 73 years ago today. It was a short trip. He led us out of the dressing room and down a thin hall to the back door. On the way past the kitchen, you could smell onions and used grease, and that's about all you noticed except the sound of a jukebox somewhere out in front and somebody laughing in a loud, mirthless way. 
When we got to the door, it was raining outside. We walked about 40 feet over near some trees where the dark was working overtime. And the gunsel made her stop. Pick your spot, Lee. You can't be that crazy, Dixie. She's going to get wet, mister. You'll have a little trouble yourself. When I woke up, it was still raining. I was lying on top of the mud like a stubborn seed. My wallet was gone, and the gunsel had ripped open my pockets. I stood up and walked over for a last look at Lee. The rain had washed the makeup off her face. And she looked small and tired as she lay there. Like a broken doll that had been tossed out in the rain. I guess she was. Well, I got to my car and I drove back to town. I checked my place, but there was no word from Jocko, so I went up to Lee's apartment. When I opened the door, the room was dark, but I knew somebody was on the rug. Either that or they'd varnished the floor with bourbon. I flipped on the light and bent over Jocko. Hey, hey, hey. Wake up, Jocko. All right, Jocko. Come on. Wake up. Come on. A little ammonia. A little ammonia, I think, would bring me around. What happened? I was uh, sapped, I guess. Uh, everybody's got the same act tonight. Uh, help me up. Come on. Where have you been? I went down to meet the girl. Where'd you meet her? In a swimming pool? I've been in the rain all night. She's going to stay longer. What'd you find out? The fellow with the sky is her husband. Yeah? There's a picture in the desk. Are there any more pictures? A few. Take a look. Okay. Where, in here? Yes. Well, well. Who's he? It must be Dixie Gillian. He was down to pay off a debt tonight. She called him Dixie once. There's a note with that name and an address in the other drawer. He's our boy. we better get up there. Not if he's already killed two other people. We can't wait for Hellman. If he gets away, I'm all through. I won't have a leg to stand on. That's my point. When the other fellow gets through with us, we won't have much standing to do. I felt better now. Gillian was the only guy left in the picture, so I dragged Jocko up to his place. It was an apartment up on Post Street. The elevator operator took us up to the eighth floor and said that Gillian had come in a few minutes before. There was no answer, so we tried the door and it was open. Jocko didn't like the idea. Patsy, this is folly. Risking my life is one of the bravest things you do. Keep still, Jocko. What are we supposed to do? The door was open, wasn't it? Saw a lot of graves, but I've never been tempted. Hey, look at the furniture. There's been a fight in here. I'll look in here and you check in the bedroom, huh? Well, if I'm not right back, don't expect me at all. All right. Patsy. Yeah. Patsy, come here. All right. There's somebody on the fire escape. Come here. Stand back here. Oh, he's not moving. He was leaning that way when I first saw him. All right. I'll get on this side. You raise the window. Now, go easy, Jocko. Can you see him from there? <laughs> raise it a little more. All right. <laughs> he's still leaning there. I can reach out. All right. Watch yourself. If he's kidding, you'll lose an arm. <laughs> I got it. Good. Raise the window more. Take the... Patsy, he's falling. Give me a hand. Oh, here. Let me through there. Oh, it's too late. I can't hold it. Hang on, Jocko. He's falling. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Well, he was probably dead anyway. If he wasn't, that was a step in the right direction. Well, it was an easy night to die. Three of them had checked out already, and there was still time to look for more. Jocko and I went downstairs to see the guy. He was lying face down in the alley, and as you looked at him, you got the funny feeling he belonged there. He didn't disturb the scene. He just fitted in like a dirty, wet newspaper under a grandstand. There was a gun in his pocket, probably the same one that killed the girl, but there was no way of knowing. Jocko and I watched him for a minute, but your eyes begin to hurt when you see your only warm lead in a deep freeze. It was past two when I got down to headquarters and looked up Hellman. I briefed him on the girl and the guy in the alley, and then I asked him if any microfilm had turned up on the first guy in the morgue. That was a waste of time. Hellman couldn't find a brass ring in a dead man's nose, but we went over to the morgue for another look. So far, it was working out like a crossword puzzle torn in half. It's your time, Novak. I got more after tomorrow. You haven't. The microfilm must be on the guy. Three people have been killed for it, and I got roughed up just for laughs. We searched the guy once. Uh, here it is. All right. Help me roll it out. Yeah. Well, well... 
He sure got thin under that sheet, didn't he? Wait a minute. Oh, you run a good morgue, Hellman. What'll the paper say when they hear the stiff got up and walked out? They got him in the wrong place or something. He didn't walk out. Well, he's gone, Hellman. You got an answer? He's been moved, I tell you. The guy was dead and I saw him put in here. Couldn't be walking around with a hole in the middle of his back. I don't know, Hellman. You do it with one in your head. Don't sell the guy short. Hellman found out the body was gone. He stood there and stared at the empty slab. And then he started looking around in a nervous way, like a man trying to find the sugar bowl at a restaurant counter. A few minutes later, he turned and walked out of the morgue, and we were halfway downtown when it happened. It must have hit us at the same time, sharp and quick, like a piece of candy and a bad tooth. The guy back in the alley had come off that slab in the morgue. We got out to Dixie's place, and we began to check. There was a phone operator downstairs, and she said that Dixie had put through a call about two hours ago. Hellman checked the number, and it was the ticket office of a railroad. We got downtown and ran through the timetable. There was a train leaving the Oakland Mole in about 40 minutes. Well, it was an outside chance, but tonight that was the only kind for sale. We got down in time to slide on the last ferry over to the Mole. It was still dark out when the ferry pulled away from the slip and started across the bay. But over toward the Berkeley Hills, it was beginning to get light. The sky was the color of a bruise spot on a man's arm. We'll get up to the pilot house and tell him not to dock until we've gone through all the passengers. He doesn't have to be on this one. We'll check the train when we get there. Wait a minute. You don't have to check. There's your boy. Where? Up there on the rail, see? Well, you better go easy, Hellman. He's not a scale model. Yeah. Just walk quietly until we're behind him. All right. Turn around, Let's... mister. You'll get a better view. Hello, Novak. How was the wind and the rain in your hair? Meet Inspector Hellman. You better turn in your ticket. I hope you brought your muscle. Grab him, Hellman. That's what I'm trying to do. All right, copper. Watch it. And he pissed over on the rail. I'm worried, Hellman. Watch it, Novak. I'm going over. That's one down, mister. Now for you. I landed on the deck and watched him disappear into the dark. Halfway down, the guy turned in. I got up and followed him down the ladder and along the main deck. He ducked into one of the engine spaces, and I started in to look for him. It didn't take long, because he turned out to be real helpful. You got the idea yet, Novak? I'll come closer. Tell me then. Suit yourself. But I'll knock you down hard when you show. Watch that platform. You're backing into trouble. Stay back there, Novak. Watch out for that platform, will you? You're backing into the engine. Ah! Kind of wound up last, huh? Yeah. That's the way it looks. Huh? Did you get the microfilm? Yeah. Well, I got a big hurt. Does it show? A little. Yeah. It's been a long night, Novak. Huh? Yeah. But your worries are over. It's almost dawn. I don't know if I can use it. But I'll give it to you. Hellman out of an oil slick a few minutes later. It was the first time his hair ever looked good. Dixie Gillian lasted long enough to piece the story together for homicide. Lee Underwood knew her husband was carrying microfilm, and she was worried, so she hired me to scare off Gillian. Oh, it might have worked, too, but the first slip came when Lee's husband went by to make a deal with Dixie without telling her. When I jumped him, Dixie was outside and figured it was a double cross, so he killed him with a silencer when that phony gun that Lee gave me went off. Dixie knew that the microfilm was still on the dead man. The only way he could be sure was to get the body out of the morgue. He took it up to his apartment, and when he got the film, he planted the gun and put the body on the fire escape. It was a little safer that way. There was a 50-50 chance the police would miss it the first time around, and he'd have a fair lead. Well, almost worked out for him, except for that phone call. The microfilm was in a capsule next to the roof of the guy's mouth. So old, it was new again. Well, Hellman asked only one question. In that fight, did I have anything to do with pushing him against the rail? 
I told them sometimes those ferry boats roll as much as 45 degrees. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the tenth of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Seventy-three years ago, April 16th, 1949, Pat Novak for Hire on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Of course, Jack Webb being uh, accompanied by Raymond Burr and Tudor Owen playing Jocko. Uh, He did that uh, role, and that was about it, except for uh, being in the 101 Dalmatians, lots of other little roles. Uh, visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. That is classicradio.stream. If you miss a day on this station, you don't have to miss a single show. You can hear all of our shows on demand there, a lot of them with a lot of other places. And by all means, thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every Saturday. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. <laughs>